My name is uh, Ben Howard, and I'm on the CoreOS tools team. Um, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about moving the unmovable. Um, and what I'm um, kind of guess to, to kind of introduce what I mean by moving the unmovable. Um, in 2019, the Red Hat CoreOS team undertook a massive lift of moving our build pipeline from virtual machines into a Kubernetes open shift environment. Um, and so it was a monumental effort that involved a lot of people um, uh, across uh, two different teams. Um, actually, no, at least four teams that, that I can think of. I mean, it was a, it was a huge lift. Um, so just by way of uh, background, I've been in the cloud space for professionally uh, for the better part of 15, 16 years. Um, and uh, I've done a lot with Jenkins, Concourse, GoCD, CI, that sort of stuff. Um, but this is actually the second or third migration that I've done. Um, and this is the only one I would consider a success. Before I came to Red Hat, I worked uh, for a small company in the uh, financial sector. And they had 70 virtual machines that comprised their stack. And they decided that the, uh, Kubernetes was awesome. And they wanted to do the heavy lift from virtual machines all the way into uh, Kubernetes. Um, and in that uh, lift, they went through, and I, I helped them with it. We described the entire infrastructure in Helm charts uh, and had it so that we could deploy everything in 15 minutes or less. We had a pre-prod environment. We had the full prod environment ready to go, but the workload never shifted because we never got the, uh, the confidence that it would work. And the, the cost of making that final leap was too expensive. And one of the things in uh, working with these uh, different environments and doing these uh, heavy lifts uh, in the past is that uh, only towards the uh, end of this last one did I realize some of those lessons learned. Um, and so the context of this is going to be talking about moving the CoreOS build pipeline from virtual machines into Kubernetes. But I want to talk more about the, uh, the general and talk in terms of what is unmovable. Um, and so I, in preparing for this, I went off and looked at some, some interesting stats and found that um, a lot of the cloud migration efforts, they simply will fail, or they run longer than expected, or they go way over budget. And part of that, I think, is because the problem domain is poorly understood. Um, and so part of our problem when we started moving the pipeline was we referred to it as the pipeline. That one word, the, should have been our warning, that we were dealing with something that had an identity. Um, and it told us one important thing, that we had a pet. Um, and way back, a few years ago, we started hearing this phrase in Kubernetes that pet services are out there. And if you try to move a pet service, it's going to become a Kubernetes pet service. And that's bad. Um, and so my uh, wife was uh, uh, sending me texts of the, the cat. And um, I thought this picture was really useful. That is the end of our bed. And um, that is her blanket. Uh, Mia is a delightful 13-year-old cat. And uh, she really hates it when her environment is disturbed. If you move that blanket, you will hear about it. Um, in the morning, she wants her blanket warmed. She even has a, a heating blanket that slips underneath it that's made specifically for pets. And she will tell us to turn her blanket on. She really likes her environment. They don't like being moved, and they don't like their environment being disturbed. But we also discovered that someone lied. There are no pet services. There are no cattle services, for that matter. There are gremlins. And if you remember from the 1980s, 
we had that uh, kind of quasi puppet whore from, I don't even know if Jim Henson uh, uh, did it, but gremlins, they're all cute and fuzzy until you decide to feed them after midnight. And when you feed them after midnight, all sorts of things, bad things happen. And the biggest problem when you're trying to move something that is big and unmovable is the way that you think about the problem. And I said earlier that um, we were using the pipeline, and we use the phrase the pipeline, I think, as I was thinking about this uh, for and in, in preparing, I think we continue to use it even after we have multiple versions of the pipeline and multiple iterations of the pipeline. And so our thinking is that we take this thing that's unmovable and it becomes unmovable because we've given it an identity. And that identity is often conflating the process of producing the work, why it exists in the first place, with the output. And so um, and, uh, one of the things that, that I noticed was we were talking about moving it, which is something that implies you can just pick it up and put it someplace else against the Kubernetes idea of deploying the service. Um, and so that speaks to the kind of the environment. So um, we probably spent about six months on this journey before we kind of settled in some place um, uh, safe. Um, and I like to refer to this as gremlin training. Um, because you have to wrangle this, un this big, unmovable problem. And what you have to do is you have to figure out kind of a guess, you know, how to land someplace that's workable. In those phases, we started off first with all virtual machines, the classic uh, sort of world. Then we had a transitional period where we had Jenkins running on OpenShift. Jenkins was the process that drove the uh, pipeline with VMs doing the work. And then we got uh, religious about OpenShift, and we wanted it to run all on OpenShift. And we then put a bunch of really smart people on it, and we uh, worked it out. Um, and the last part of getting all in OpenShift was probably the hardest. So what we, we learned is that uh, the environment is the single largest obstacle when moving a service. And when um, I talk about the environment, um, there are certain things that are inherent and implicit in an environment uh, when you're moving or talking about a service. When you think about, um, uh, in the old days, we used to have, uh, you know, talk about our database server. is on rack, you know, 3C. It uh, had a name, call it Thanos uh, for kicks and giggles. And Thanos had so much RAM. It had these characteristics, these the identity. And when you build your database server, you, the, uh, the environment kind of imposed itself. And changing the environment, such as changing characteristics regarding memory or CPU, environmental variables for the operating system, changing the operating system itself, all these things contribute to that. And when you move something from one environment to another, you are breaking some of those implicit assumptions. And if you don't take the time to understand them, then your gremlin will get uh, really unhappy. And that's what I mean by gremlins really like their home. When you move something over, you, there are things that you could take for granted that you can't anymore. In our case, when we're building an operating system, uh, performance is kind of important. And we ran into problems with speed. Um, we ran into memory constraints because of some of the, uh, uh, the way that OpenShift uh, was constraining us in terms of CPU caps, um, memory limitations, device access, um, network bandwidth, um, you name it. And some of these things just suddenly start changing. Unless you take the time to understand what exactly the workload's doing before you embark on it, you're going to uh, experience a level of iterative pain that only gets worse. Um, and I'd like to uh, uh, propose that if you're using the terms moving, uh, 
you're already off to a bad start. And the reason for this is that, again, in, in doing the research, um, business analysts use the phrase lift and shift, and they uh, say that when you do a lift and shift to the cloud, this is going from bare metal to virtual machines in the cloud, it almost never works. And the reason it almost never works is because you're changing the environment and the characteristics, and so that gremlin, you're gonna move it into the cloud, feed it after midnight, and when it blows up, your life is going to be very unfun. And we decided that we were gonna move the pipeline, and we did move it. Uh, and over six months, we experienced a lot of pain. Um, so some of the things that, that um, where we kind of went off the deep end was we wanted to move the pipeline. And with that, we wanted the pipeline to work in one environment to work in another environment. And we went through all sorts of fun pain um, because we wanted feature parity. Like one of the examples of feature parity is we were running Jenkins and our users were used to interacting with Jenkins. But OpenShift in Kubernetes gives us the ability to expose different options through uh, uh, in the YAML um, through environmental characteristics, which Jenkins then uh, reads in as parameters. And so, um, uh, one uh, developer and I, we went back and forth on uh, how this should be handled. And we were trying to figure out, uh, trying to figure out how to get truth of what the default option was going to be. And we ended up in a case where you could end up with three different ways to get what was a default option. Because we'd get it from OpenShift, which would then tell Jenkins, and then finally the pipeline would have its own defaults. And only by following through all three of those could you know what was gonna happen. And so we spent, uh, I spent way too much time figuring out what was going on. Um, and then we ended up coming up with this idea of declarative uh, specifications where we said, this is the way it will be, and we went to explicit options where we started defining the environment explicitly. Um, and we also discovered that some of the flexibility that we, didn't, that we needed when it was a pet, we no longer needed because deployments are cheap. As we started doing the, the deployments and discovered that we had the ability to do developer builds, we went from having one pipeline to at last count about 20 different pipelines that are running um, from different developer options because instead of going through and clicking a cl uh, checkbox, you could change some YAML somewhere. Um, and uh, so, so just for some information, part of what we are doing is we are using Jenkins um, with its pod templates to construct a pod, and um, we uh, went to doing completely ephemeral builds uh, where we construct the pod um, uh, at uh, initialization time, it contains absolutely no state. We uh, uh, take our CoreOS assembler, which is the code that builds CoreOS, a Jenkins slave, time together to report back to Jenkins, and, um, and then it goes off and does the build. But one of the things that we also did is discover uh, is that, that Jenkins, when I uh, talk to people about Jenkins, um, there are two types the, of people when you talk about Jenkins, those that love Jenkins and those that hate Jenkins. Um, most people who love Jenkins haven't had an experience with Jenkins uh, to know that they really don't like Jenkins. Um, and, uh, and so what we ended up doing was we moved away from Jenkins as the source of truth because we didn't want it to have any sort of state. Another problem that we had was we had four different sets of defaults because we were using mutually exclusive templating systems. I'm a makefile geek, and uh, then we also had the YAML uh, templates. We had Jenkins with the Groovy trying to get stuff, and we had OpenShift, and all of those ones came together, and we spent a ridiculous amount of try time trying to merge them. And uh, one of the things that went uh, wrong was trying to figure out what was true. 
um, which seems like it would be very easy to do, but because we had all these different inputs instead of one input, we didn't change our environment to be able to deal with, with it just being, deal with one set of defaults, is that we were taking OpenShift, we'll send a environment variable over as an, uh, as an end bar for a parameter which means that you end up with something that evaluates to true even when it's not. And so we ended up trying to figure out why our different configs were broken, and it was because we had multiple sources of truth. Um, and this is an example of, of where you can end up with something going wrong. That's just uh, uh, one of the early, uh, I guess, iterations where we'd say make something and uh, we would set uh, uh, something in the uh, make file, which would then go off and change something in the template, but the template itself also had a default, and so we just ended up burning all that and went to just one single source of truth. Another thing, um, and this is something that um, I've done some thinking about, um, we really haven't gotten there, is that there is a temptation, a strong temptation when you're doing um, your code to take it and turn uh, your, your options into parameters. But what uh, we ended up um, seeing time and time again is that all you're doing is making indirect pain uh, because you end up defining the, va the, the variable in multiple places. So you have to use the variable here uh, uh, in the actual code, in the representation. Then you have to set it somewhere. And then you also have to set it in your template. Um, and so uh, what you want to do is instead, when you're changing the environment, is um, switch it over at the same time. If you can describe your service in JSON and YAML, which is how you get it into Kubernetes, you should probably be able to do the same thing with your environment. So embrace the JSON and the YAML early, use it, and teach your service how to use it. We ended up, um, uh, as we were going through um, converting our environment, we defined what we call the job spec. Uh, the job spec um, uh, is, um, gave us a lot of flexibility where before, we had some small um, uh, set of options that was probably maybe about a dozen different ways to do builds. Now we're able to do probably several thousand different types of builds based on changing different parts of the YAML. Uh, so the two options that um, are, are very clear is, is one, uh, option two, which I was talking about, is uh, teach your, your gremlins to understand the YAML, but the uh, other one is to use uh, config and uh, secret maps um, and then source them to set the environment um, on a per uh, service or per deployment. Um, the reason for that is that it allows you to uh, store your config in a Kubernetes way, and for things like secrets, you can share them within the namespace. Um, and so, you know, standard sort of uh, Kubernetes um, uh, things. I wish we had done it earlier. We started doing it with just secrets, um, and uh, I think it would uh, have made our life a little bit easier in the long run. Um, another thing is make sure that you loosely couple your environment. Um, when you start, uh, the big thing is making, uh, as you unwind it, um, make it so that you can change your environment as you, you move along. Um, so we ended up separating uh, our code, of uh, what we called our core OS assembler, keeping it separate from our pipeline code, which also um, had uh, our uh, templates. And we've been wanting for some time to unwind that, to actually have our Kubernetes templates outside the code. But one of the, uh, the other things that we ended up doing is we introduced configuration branches for holding our uh, uh, job specs so that we could describe all those different variations. So that what we can end up doing is just changing one bit of YAML and we can change 
the location for everything else. Um, another problem that we, we ran into was how is state going to be stored? Um, one of the, uh, the things that, that um, happens when you run Jenkins is when Jenkins is unhappy, it is horribly unhappy. And the, the question is, how do you recover? Going in and trying to recover Jenkins after it has crashed or uh, just went to lunch or something like that became problematic. Um, and then there was the other problem that we ended up having where um, once we have one, you're going to want another and another and another. Um, and so um, uh, we uh, tackled that question and moved state outside um, so that we're storing that in, in S3 or in uh, Koji. We also learned that, that Jenkins is not well suited for the cloud. Um, we hit some, some um, problems that um, uh, at the, uh, for, for a while there, one of my favorite commands was uh, OC delete pod slash Jenkins. Um, if I was having a bad day, I would just run it, just for kicks and giggles. Um, and if a build was having problems, just run that. Um, because we got to the point where we were able to blow Jenkins away and Jenkins no longer be was a pet. It simply was an execution environment. Um, and so one of the things that um, I would challenge people when you're moving something that is uh, your unmovable task is to look at what you're actually doing. What is the actual workload? Is the, uh, in, like in the case of Jenkins and some of the CI things, you will notice that Jenkins itself becomes the pet and that what you're really after is the workload or the output. Uh, and so what uh, we ended up doing was we put a lot of engineering around making it so that Jenkins was simply an execution uh, runner. That results in us making our own um, master and slave Docker, uh, I guess, container images, since I was paying attention to Dan Walsh earlier, um, and uh, where we ended, uh, made it so that uh, Jenkins was completely scripted, where it would come up and on uh, restart, it would not remember any prior history. We didn't want Jenkins to be the center of gravity. The purpose of the pipeline was the output of OS disk images. It was not to run Jenkins. Um, and so be very careful that you don't conflate what runs your workload with what your workload is. Um, and uh, for, for a while there, we also really liked master, but a certain developer wanted to break stuff a lot. And uh, we got religion qu uh, quick about pinning um, rather uh, early on. Um, and what we started doing with uh, the pinning uh, was that we would use different Git branches uh, for configurations, different ones for the version of the pipeline, and different tags to be able to create certain uh, versions of, uh, core of the, the build pipeline. Um, as a result, right now we have uh, four production versions that are running, all based on snapshots in the code. But it also um, gave us the ability to break stuff um, and not break production. Another uh, thing that we um, experienced was, in, at least with uh, OpenShift, you aren't supposed to run by default as root. You can, but the, uh, uh, we ran into some privilege problems. Um, and if you need uh, root, first question you should be asking is why and do you really need it? In our case, we did because we needed KVM access uh, and that resulted uh, in, uh, and I'll get to that, but essentially you don't need it. So use the, the opportunity in this lift to move away from running this route. Um, so KVM is really difficult in Kubernetes uh, at least because it all depends on the way it's set up. 
Um, so um, when I prepared the slide, I said we had three OpenShift environments. I've since been corrected that we had four OpenShift environments that we moved this through. Um, each one had a different method of KVM access. Uh, and so the first one, we did virtualized KVM. That was dreadful, hated it. Um, so then we ended up moving to a different one where we got a, uh, used a direct KVM through a, a package. Third one, we end up with a service account so that we can go ahead and do, uh, you know, get our access. But the problem then was we ended up in a privileged pod, and that's bad uh, because now we're running our process as root, which you'll recall I said don't do. So what we end up doing in, in this one is we start up, give ourselves the access we need to KVM, drop privileges, and then uh, pretend like we don't have the, the permissions to run as root. Um, so the lesson that this, that in all four or three or four of those environments that we, we learned was that if you aren't very careful, you will trade uh, one tightly coupled environment for another tightly coupled environment. Um, and this, this can be true in the cloud as well as in OpenShift or at self-hosted Kubernetes. As you start using the limitate or uh, the full capabilities of your environment, you will invariably make things difficult for you later if you aren't uh, paying attention to what you're doing. Uh, so for that, um, there are some things you can do to um, protect yourself. One is use variables whenever you can um, for things like DNS names, um, uh, uh, host names, what, whatever. Um, uh, we don't do it in our pipeline, but there are some Kubernetes um, uh, ideas. One is external names, where you can give in-cluster names to external services. Uh, same thing uh, with external IPs, where you uh, use a proxy. Um, both of those are great ways to be able to do things like firewalls um, and give your stuff the access it needs. But um, by using in-cluster naming, the main advantage is that you can further decouple uh, from the external environment. Um, and then the other problem that we had was a fun little lesson on uh, our test and uh, de uh, deployment of our services. We have dev and get ops. And this was one that we, as a team, debated for, for quite some time. Um, and I think we're still settling on that. Um, when you have a virtual machine, you often will do things like Ansible and config uh, management, Puppet, uh, Chef, whatever. Um, so the way that you actually uh, uh, manage your service needs to fundamentally change. And so you have to ask the question, how are you going to be doing your deployment? And uh, we ended up shifting in large part over to some combination of, I guess, uh, kind of a Devi GitOps sort of thing where we uh, do all of our stuff based on Git polls uh, or PRs. And uh, we even uh, make um, uh, use uh, GitLab to do some CI on our pipeline. Um, another uh, mistake was we tried to support Jenkins and the Jenkins way of doing things um, while also trying to do uh, OpenShift things. OpenShift allows you to be able to do uh, build triggers based on URL callbacks. So does Jenkins. And the problem is, is that if you do both of those, you can end up with unexpected results um, based on Jenkins parameters, for example. So what we ended up um, doing was we backed out all the Jenkins stuff and just used the Kubernetes primitives. Um, the reason that that worked better for us is that we moved to the declarative, uh, uh, declarative method of configuring our pipeline. We didn't want to have unexpected results if someone changed a parameter in a URL. Uh, so what we did is just uh, backed out, used just what's coming in through the configuration, um, and we now ignore input parameters coming in other than we wanted a build to, uh, to happen. 
but um, if you mix things, mix what, where your inputs are coming in from, you're going to end up with um, a truthiness problem. Um, and then an and, uh, interesting side effect from this was that as our pipeline started becoming more and more durable um, and it was stable, our risk tolerance went down. Um, and then we started CI in the CI. Uh, that was uh, uh, having GitLab run CI checks against our Jenkins jobs um, made it so that we, we did uh, reduce some of our outages but we've done other things uh, to keep things more tolerant. Um, so the, uh, one of the bigger uh, issues that we also explored was, I, I would probably say, complicated setup. We introduced a bunch of knobs because we had the ability to. Once we had uh, uh, a way to descriptively describe our environment, to describe how we wanted to build, um, we started adding knobs for everything. We had a knob to force builds. We had one for a dry run to do everything but upload stuff. We had knobs for uh, skipping certain tests uh, or certain uh, uh, parts of the code. And what ended up happening was that the code started getting very clever, but it also became dangerous. Um, and um, uh, we ended up um, going back and removing the code. And I would um, uh, say that one of the big lessons learned is that any time we introduced complexity, we introduced brittle code, and that brittle code made it uh, difficult to debug. Reducing your, com uh, uh, reducing, um, if, you, if you can reduce your code, reduce the complexity, make things simple while you're doing the lift, your life will be much easier. So make sure that you're managing your complexity. And looking at the complexity before you start your, your lift will make your life easier. Um, this one was our biggest pain point, was the internal CAs. Um, the reason this was, was difficult is that OpenShift, uh, because of its internal security model, uh, does not let your containers run as root. So we had a internal CA cert that we needed to apply, and uh, uh, because of changes with the underlying um, disk or uh, con container images we were using, um, about every couple weeks a build would happen and our uh, CA was not being trusted. And uh, we weren't able to do the regular update model. Um, after several iterations, we just ended up with a base container um, that we used to build all our uh, infrastructure uh, containers. Um, I would say that uh, having a base container to start with your most base configurations for things like internal certificates, common packages, and things like that would be a best practice. Um, I wish we had done it earlier. It would have solved a lot of pain later. Um, and so um, the one thing that we did do in the six months with four or three, uh, four different versions of OpenShift um, was that we planned for frequent deployments. Um, and that was from day one. We, um, uh, from when I, we started on this journey we decided we wanted to be able to blow the entire pipeline away and start over from scratch. From 3.7 to 3.11, uh, the first time we moved from one version of OpenShift to another one, it took about two weeks for us to do the move. Um, the last move that we did took 45 minutes, and it was a fire. Um, there was a issue where our environment disappeared because of some hardware problems, and we were in full out panic mode. But because we had been prepared and we were able to describe our entire environment, including the secrets, it took 45 minutes. And the only reason it took 45 minutes was because we had to wait for the container images to do their builds. Um, as a result of that, um, uh, and we'll get to it later, but there are uh, at least four teams that are running copies of our pipeline 
Um, that's the uh, art team which runs our production teams um, and uh, uh, a multi-arch team. We have our own development builds um, and uh, you know, today you could take that um, if, uh, for those internal to Red Hat and run your own copy. Now, um, so, you know, I've already hit on, on most of these points, um, and I'd say that the, the biggest thing that I wish that we had done when we did the lift was we had challenged our base assumptions. Um, I uh, uh, think that if we were to step back and do this again, we would probably not do Jenkins. We would look at our base technologies and look at what really was, was there, and we would use that. Um, and uh, so, um, so just I guess you know quickly until I have ten minutes here, is that um, we had to change our thinking, and if we changed our thinking earlier, our life would be easier. Um, and uh, so far, I'd say that, that we're a little bit happier. So the gremlins, they've all been placated, um, and um, uh, right now. One of, I, I would say, our success points is that developers um, can now run and test their code in pipelines without having to do so on their desktop. And it is one of the fastest ways to bootstrap a new developer is to give them a pipeline. Um, and so I guess in conclusion, um, I'll leave you with this thought, is that if we thought more about the results and less about the how, we would have made different decisions. And if you have an unmovable workload, it's probably unmovable because you are, th um, you are thinking about the how of moving it instead of the results that you want. Step back, consider it, and all of a sudden those things that are unmovable will become mo uh, movable for you. So uh, with that, I guess we're open up for questions. Um, I've looked at it, um, but haven't had a chance to play with it. The question was, had I looked at Tecton yet? How much, so if, oh, uh, so, so the gains, uh, the question was what gains did we expect when we made the move from virtual machines to VMs? Um, as I understand it, it was because we were building core OS, which uh, is the base of OpenShift. We wanted to dog food our own technology, um, and we wanted to uh, see if, what it would take to get it done. Um, and uh, so. That's, that's kind of what we did. What we ended up gaining was, I would say, a lot more than we had before. Um, probably the, the biggest gain in, in the move was being able to build arbitrary pipelines based on whatever configuration we wanted. Um, and so uh, as a result, um, we are able to test different versions of CoreOS Assembler, different packages. Um, before this, when a person needed to test a, a different version of of Red Hat Core OS, and they needed maybe just a one different package um, added or removed, or maybe a different configuration that could be tested, um, it would take us time to do that. Now we can produce an image uh, artifact in less than an hour um, if we have the configuration. So it gave us the ability to, to react um, much faster than we previously have been able to. And now I think uh, people uh, kind of expect that we can do that sort of turnaround time, which is a, is a downside. So, so the first question would be is, what is the OCI KVM hook and how did that help? Um, OCI KVM hook simply inserts dev KVM into uh, images. It's a Fedora package that you can install. Uh, no, no, you don't need to. 
the question was, do you need to run the container in privilege mode to run uh, QEMU in it? Um, not quite sure I follow. We aren't using uh, Anaconda anymore. Um, and so uh, CoreOS Assembler is a, is a set of tools that builds the RPM OS tree and then we build the disk images ourselves. So we don't use the Anaconda at all. Uh, uh, in a virtual machine, you, you could, so the question, um, rephrasing, can you do Anaconda-based installs in a container this way? Uh, you can use invert install if you have access to a KVM device. Um, in early iterations of it, we were doing invert installs uh, with KVM access. Any other questions, Steve? Yeah, so the question was uh, that one of the things that I had noted was that we would consider other technologies. Um, uh, one of the lessons that I think was um, a, a team member asked a rather salient question after I put together uh, a, I think it was like a three or 400 line um, PR that was a bunch of gr uh, Groovy. And the question was, why are we doing this in Groovy? Why aren't we doing this elsewhere? And uh, in retrospect, I think that one of, one of the things that we were doing is we were putting so much energy into Jenkins itself and Jenkins technology, not into the build output. And we had something else. So um, I would have used um, build configs um, themselves and uh, used OpenShift to execute those parts of uh, the code that we wanted. And then using you could chain those together so that Jenkins wouldn't even be needed. Use the, the pure Kubernetes primitives instead of sugar around it. Any last questions? Thank you.